Hello, my name is Maxine Ward and I am a professional celebrant. I'm also one of the trainers at the International College of Professional Celebrants. And I'm here today with my colleagues to talk about uh, mental well-being. Sometimes funerals can be very, very difficult. So how can they be difficult? And Mike and I have talked about what's hard about being a celebrant and touched upon it briefly. Um, but how do we manage that? So um, I'd like my colleagues to introduce themselves and we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, um, my name's Mike Warren. I'm a full-time celebrant, but I'm also one of the trainers with ICP. Hello everyone, my name is Julie and I'm part of the training team. Um, I'm also the operations director for ICPC and a part-time celebrant. And I'm Stuart Morris. I'm uh, a full-time celebrant and uh, also the founder of uh, ICPC. So I guess at its very, very base level, we are dealing with death and death is a difficult thing um, and different cultures manage it in different ways. But there is always some emotion associated with that. And sometimes it might be sadness, sometimes it might be anger and sometimes it, it may be something else altogether. And we're, we're always running into that where we can find um, our own emotions um, rise up and and challenges in in ways that we expect or sometimes we don't expect they could be a bit of a surprise so um i wondered Stuart, starting with you are you able to share um a story about when when that's caught you by surprise uh, your emotions and and how you went on to manage that yeah i think um you need to be aware that there's a, something can jump up and catch you completely by surprise in a situation a perfectly normal funeral something that doesn't seem to be particularly difficult in any way but then there are the ones that are obvious so for example taking a funeral for um uh, a baby mm. if you've lost a baby at, at some point in the past then you know that's that could well suddenly have have an impact um i think the the ones that um perhaps catch you or catch me are where somebody i'm um, doing a funeral for somebody who had similar characteristics to a, a grandparent or something like that and, you know, and they, they grew up in the same part of the world or had a similar career and suddenly you remind i was reminded of uh, of my grandparents and that sort of ooh, that hurt a little bit more than I was expecting it to. Um, and actually, for me, the best way of, of processing that is to allow it to hurt. You know, once you've delivered the ceremony, go and sit in the car and think about grandma or whatever it was. Um, and then have a conversation with a friend, you know, get on the phone and just have a chat. And it may not even be uh, a chat about the situation or about the funeral, just mm life get up get on with living life rather than sitting and that's not to push the grief down because grief is there and grief exists for a long time acknowledge the grief and get on with the with the living as i always say you know, grief is evidence that we loved somebody it's a positive thing if we didn't love them we wouldn't grieve them yeah absolutely thank you so much and i think it's it's really important to recognize that um grief um, and we talk about something called transference, don't we? And it's about recognising if you're taking on somebody else's grief. Um, and that can happen. I know my sister, when my, when my mum died, did that. And it was very, very difficult for her. But I think it's, you know, that, that grieving process might feel similar to one that you've had in the past. Um, you might recognise that. You might recognise some behaviours. And, and on the other side, I think it's also very important to make sure that your feelings aren't transferred onto the onto the family. So I guess what we're saying is is a, to have a sense of awareness of what is happening so that you're then in a position to, to deal with it um, rather than just getting carried away in, in the whole process. Because I think one important part of um, looking after your mental well-being is recognising um, that something needs to be done. Um, Julie, can you think of any um, particular services where it's there's um been a sort of emotional challenge for you or something I that think resonates every with ceremony you. every funeral ceremony 
um, you ever take um, has its challenges. Um, as you have said before, it can be that you have you think you're completely on top of it. You've practiced your ceremony. You've looked at places where you know they might be more heightened emotionally, and you've desensitized yourself because you know you're you're going to do that. You're going to practice and and try very hard to look to see where you might be affected. But um, at the end of the day, sometimes it's a piece of music, or it's. It's, or seeing mm. somebody who suddenly breaks down in front of you and they're in a complete mess and you hadn't prepared for that because when you've been practicing in your room, in your office, that doesn't happen. <laughs> so I think that if I see somebody distraught, um, then it catches me and I can feel my throat tightening and I can see the emotion mm -hmm. on theirs and it, it would be very easy for me to let go and cry with them. But I think when you're trained properly, you learn that you have to be the professional in the room. You have to be the person that it's not about, that you're facilitating and you're making it happen Absolutely. around you. You're helping the people yeah. to grieve in a way that they need to grieve. So I think that I think everybody that we train, we find a little way, a little technique, which says to their brain. So it's sort of a contact, a message straight from that moment to their brain. It's not about us. We're going to do whatever we do. Some people pinch their thumbs and their nails in. I always pull my tummy button in. Other people clench their bottoms. They have all kinds of things. <laughs> Some people just take a deep breath or pause or step away. Whatever it is, we find a strategy to stay the professional in the room, the one that's been employed to mm -hmm. do the very best service for the deceased and to help the grieving family. So that's what I mean by every ceremony has the opportunity of being a little bit too much sometimes. Yeah, I think so. I, I personally um, <laughs> wiggle my toes in my shoes um, <laughs> and and repeat the mantra, it's not about me. but. I mean, I think there's a big difference sometimes bet between having a tear in your eye and, and being absolutely full of it and, and yes. on the point of, you know, be, feeling like you're, you're, you're part of the, 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 the family. Um, and, you know, we're all human, aren't we, um, after yeah. all? And I think we have to accept that fact. We're not machines and our humanity um, and empathy is something that really drives yeah. us to be celebrants it's it's part yeah. of what we want to do we're helping people through some of the most um difficult periods in their lives and i think it's it's important for us to think you know we are human because our humanity makes us who we are absolutely mike can you think of any times when you found um a funeral particularly challenging yeah there's been there's been there's been quite a few times um but sometimes they sort of crop up and and they hit you when you're not ready for it. You know, um, it might be it might be sort of the words that are said. So mm -hmm. you might have a family member that comes up and they express something which is very heartfelt. You know, there was there was one chap I remember who came up. He didn't want me to have the words ahead of time, although I asked him for it. He said, no, I've just got some bullet points. And I thought, OK, OK, that's that's fine if if that's and it's the worst thing ever, isn't it? You know, when you think hopefully this won't go on for absolutely you know, minutes <laughs> on end. You know. But yeah. you know, knowing that apprehension of me feeling, oh, I wonder if he's just going to go on forever, uh, which he didn't do, uh, then that sort of transferred across to listening to a fairly short but incredibly heartfelt tribute to his mum, which was very short. It was probably just a page of notes, really, or a page of, of writing. But the words that were said were so incredibly beautiful. It, it made me think, and I think the thought went through my mind, that is the sort of words I would say about my mum. And as soon as I heard that, you know, I, I, it triggered me, you know, mm. it's, sometimes it's the, the pictures that are seen because you, the family will prepare the photographs of maybe a screen tribute and you may not see them. And when it comes to that, when you see photographs of families having a good time and how much they meant, 
that can trigger you as well. And also music. things to do, sometimes the music, like you said, Julie, the music can actually trigger you because the choice of music is just so incredibly beautiful and it can trigger you. So sometimes I get triggered inside a, a, a ceremony and often it's afterwards that, you know, like Stuart said, you know what you do afterwards. But within a ceremony, I suppose you are there to do a professional job. And they, I always say to myself that the family need you. They don't need you to be one of the mourners. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> they need you to, you're a safe, you're a safe, calm pair of hands, professional. And they are relying on you to remain so. <laughs> So when you, if you do start bawling your eyes out halfway through, that's not what the family want. No. So no. techniques, we learn them on the course, but techniques, um, some things that I do, one thing I do is just to step back and sometimes my, my voice will go and they will know that I've just, I've got all churned up, but I just have a little bit of a pause and then I carry on. And I think Stuart, you do much the same. And, and actually that helps me but actually just going going home and uh, de de-stressing having having a drink and just calming down but just thinking about it is an important thing to do as, as a celebrant and i think that, that comment you made mike about having taking a moment just having that moment of a pause yeah just gather nobody you know, it might seem like an awfully long pause to you in the yeah. Um, but actually everybody else would just oh that's okay they'll, they'll be catching up um and um yeah going home glass of water cup of tea whatever it is just something to to sit and, to and take off yeah. the uniform of your celebrancy so you've gone there in a jacket or a smart suit or and you have your name badge on and you're there in professional mode and then for the sense of completion and and that is that job is now done i need to move into my other kind of life if you change your clothes take your badge yeah. off maybe go for a walk let the the air blow the cobwebs away and then you can start being yourself again mm -hmm. not your professional self and i think that that really helps to change the frame of mind absolutely yeah. so we're starting to get some some really good tips on 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 what to do to, to manage that. And um, I wanted to talk about we've talked about the, the the service itself, but as we know, celebrancy that's that's kind of the end of the process really. Um, and um, I found it so. So you're working with families, and you you have a very deep emotional connection with them over a very short space of time. So it's really intense. And one of the things that I found most difficult. Um, for me emotionally was um, I had a, 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 a lady who'd lost her husband. He'd been diagnosed with cancer and died four months later. And that was very similar to my mum. So her diagnosis to when she passed was very short. And when she said that, I honestly, I felt in the room like I'd been punched in the stomach. I could just feel it go, oh, like that. And that was really hard. And I really had to stop myself because I could feel the tears um, welling up. Um, but it's I think it's easy to support a family when you when you get that bond, however short it is. I think sometimes it's difficult when you don't have it. And this particular case, um, she couldn't look at me. Um, she didn't speak to me much. It was very difficult to have that relationship all the way through and at the end. Um, and I found that emotionally challenging because I came away feeling that there was more I wanted to do and more that I wanted to say to her. Um, and again, it's not about my, so I had to sit and, you know, sat myself down and had a word with myself is that I, you know, if I've done what she needed me to do, then that's enough. It's not for me to be feel fulfilled at the end of it um, as much as I do at the end of um, most funerals. So it's a different thing. And, and I'd like to get on to talking about when you're actually going to the family meeting and some of the challenges around um you know working with the family taking that on and how you work with them and the difference really between being an empath and a therapist so julie what do you think the, the pitfalls are and the difficulties and the things we should be looking out for in order to protect our emotional and mental well-being i there? think you have just illustrated um something actually max that if it resonates with you if you were not the professional in the room 
you could be drawn into a conversation about your own life and about your own grief. And I think as professional celebrants, we're not there to do that. We're there to listen and to listen very carefully, carefully mm. and very actively and to pick up on the clues that you're being given. I did a family meeting yesterday, yesterday evening, and um, it was quite difficult getting information out. And as I was standing up to go, she said, uh, oh, well, we're all going to be in pink and teal. And I said, oh, OK, that's really interesting. Tell me a little bit about those colour choices. That opened up about another 30 minutes of conversation because she hadn't considered those things <laughs> important. But I have, I would have, could have easily shared my own experience and got emotionally involved, but I didn't. I just kept actively listening and trying to be the professional, but a kind professional. So softening voice mm -hmm. and really knowing, letting them know that you're listening to every single word and treasuring each word. So the brother of, of the next of kin was there and um, he said something along the lines of, I'm just going to miss talking to her. Now you could just let that go or write that down, but what I decided to do was to honor that. And I said, that is absolutely a wonderful thing to recognize um, his name. And um, I, yeah. I, if you're going to write your tribute, I would really suggest you include that because that is a wonderful thing to miss about a person. And he relaxed and he felt heard. Mm. And I think those are important techniques when you're in that meeting to not get involved in your own story, but to make it all about them. And that is a boundary. So you're boundary in your own emotion. They probably know nothing about me, but they know that they were heard mm. by me. And when I left, they said, we think you've got her now. We uh, we think you understand who she is. And I think that's a lovely feeling to come away. And it gives you confidence to write the eulogy about that person. Her own children have told you that you've got her. So, so that's really interesting, isn't it? I think what you said there was absolutely beautiful. And it contains it and stops us from moving into the therapist role because we're not therapists and we're not counsellors. And besides the, you know, the, the professional um, implications of that, going back to the mental well-being, it stops us that, that transference again, isn't it? We're not listening to their story, we're not trying to give them advice. Um, we're not, so we're not taking on all of their pain and grief. So we would, in that case, wouldn't we refer them to professionals and, and signpost them onto different things? Um, so I think being sad is normal. We can allow ourselves to be sad. Um, I just want to cover from each of you to, to finish off with sort of your, your three top tips um, ha uh, on how to prepare before you go into that uh, service, what to do during if you find that you're doing that and how you decompress after. And then let's start off with you, Mike. Okay, well, um, I sort of hinted on it earlier on. I, I'm very much that when I put on a mantle, really, and my mantle is a suit and my tie, particularly my tie. It's always been the case, even as a head teacher, I would, at the end of a hard day driving home for 30 minutes, I would take my tie off in the car, <laughs> put it to one side. I think, Stuart, I think you're exactly the same. I think you, I've seen you do that in your car before. You know, in, in some of your videos, jacket. that's it. Yeah. And you take it off. And I think for me, it's like the professional job is done, you know. So that's one way that I, I sort of de-stress, I suppose, afterwards. It is sad to be normal. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it is normal to be sad. <laughs> both are true, both are true. I'm right. <laughs> is that your mantra, Mike? <laughs> it's not sad to be normal. <laughs> It is. It's great to be normal. And <laughs> I'm digging myself a hole here. No, no, it is. Being sad is absolutely normal. It's, it is part of it. And I, I think sort of what families need is your empathy and a good listening ear. Uh, what they don't need is your sympathy, you know, because if, if you start sympathising, 
then actually you just can't you you become one of them you become there you do want to get close to them as a family for obvious reasons but you don't want to be a uh, part of them and if it's after after a funeral is over although i keep a very professional relationship with them but i i will send them a, a, an email letters but i'm not knocking on their doors every five minutes i'm not sending them um cards the year afterwards saying you know thinking of you today and things i have to be very careful of of uh, that that relationship even to the extent that some uh, often i'm asked would you like to come to the gathering afterwards down at the pub and i i always say no unless i knew the person myself you know and that's a it's a line that i draw Thank you. um yeah so it's 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 important that is really um Stuart, what are your top tips i think in the ceremony as i said earlier take a moment take if you, if you feel emotions building up which is absolutely normal just yeah. take that moment and i think also you know if i'm not feeling some emotion i'm just a robot then mm. you know it, actually that a little bit of empathy with the family when you're telling the story and, and you know that there's the son sitting in front of you and this is the bit of the story about his mum that was really really important to him and you're telling that bit of the story and you make eye contact and you know, he his eyes are welling up and your natural response is to feel that emotion well feel it but if you're not feeling it you you as i say you're just a robot and then right i'm going to pause there well he's not thinking you're pausing for you he's thinking oh he's letting me remember this it's it's lovely and then as you said mike you know, take my jacket off take my tie off sit in the car um yeah think about it for a moment look critically you know were, were there anything that i could have done better you know just look at it from that perspective um and you know as soon as i get home i get changed it's you know, off with the formal yeah. clothes on with the, the jeans the t-shirt um you know, change the mood completely um give my wife a hug whatever you know, whatever whatever's going on play with the cats re-engage in in normal life but we've talked about this and actually you know i i do as i say three to five funerals a week and i find myself built up i don't find that i'm being worn down now some people you know there are times we think oh i just need a holiday I need to stop talking about dead people uh, i say that frivolously but i don't mean it but you know for, for a lot of the time it's incredibly life affirming and incredibly um rewarding work but yeah, there are times that making the demarcation, get home, change the clothes, change the mood, do something uh, for me and, and don't sort of take on the vicarious trauma. Thank yes, you, Julie. Um, I think one of the benefits about being trained as um, a celebrant that can do all ceremonies is that for me, I want to balance my work types. So if i own if i have a big batch of funerals back to back i'm itching to do a baby naming or i'm itching to do a wedding or a vow renewal and although they can be equally as emotional they are for different reasons and i think that um, i went i was doing a wedding a couple of weeks ago the sun was shining everything was absolutely beautiful somebody had come an impromptu guitarist had come up and i just slotted her in and i stood back and i knew that i had complete control over what was going on and everything was exactly as the couple wanted and i just thought this is the best job in the world and it, <laughs> you get that different reward then. So you have the reward in funerals of, of helping people in the most difficult times of their lives to sharing the most intimate rites of passage that you could possibly be involved with. I mean, what better job could you have? Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I personally, when I come out of a service, I always look at the sky so I'm always feeling the wind on my face or the sun on my face, and it's it's really lovely. So I'd really finally like to say that we cover a lot Indeed. of this in the training, don't we? We, um, we as Stuart said earlier on, there are some um, funerals that are more difficult emotionally um, to prepare for and and to actually conduct than others, and we we 
cover that in in the training in a warm um, and safe environment where we can help you think about that. Um, and finally, I'd, I'd like to end by saying, you know, everybody's mental health is important. Um, thank you so much for listening to our podcast, but make sure that you look after yours.